Hi there. So we're going to do two recap lectures for you just to help you with your second assignment. So the idea in these um, recap lectures isn't that we're presenting new content at this stage. It's far too late to be doing that to you. What we need to do instead is to help you signpost um, the right parts of the content to the second assignment. So that's the role of what I'd like to do today with you. OK, so um, we're looking at the second assignment now and we're looking at the marketing contents for the second assignment. So let's just recap what the second assignment's about. So you're selecting a company from the FTSE 250. So you're going to pick one where you can find lots of publicly available information. You're going to compare, contrast, analyse the information um, and their financial performance risks uh, and everything around their competitive environment. Um, so it's an individual marketing report, which I believe is around 3000 words plus or minus 10%. So what I'd suggest that we do is when you're looking at this, there's a really helpful framework for how to approach this assignment under the resources on week six. And that was what I presented in our seminar on week six. So what I've done is I've gone through those notes and I've looked at which models and which frameworks were covered in the marketing content um, that support you answering those sections. So this presentation by no means covers everything that's required. Far from it. It, recover, it includes purely the marketing elements um, that's already been delivered to you and it's a recap. OK. So I think it would be very helpful to go back to week one and to consider with the organisation that you've chosen what their marketing exchange is. I think that would be such a good starting point because what you're doing in that, you're showing you truly understand who their audience is and what they're delivering and what they are, what's the trade-off in exchange so what they receive from that i think that also gives a really good indication that you understand core marketing content so i think that would be very helpful in your introduction okay then we also considered um, earlier on in the course something called a context analysis and that brought together the internal the external and the market uh, analysis. And actually, there are three separate sections of this report in terms of the proposed approach to answer it in week six's notes. So the internal one, I'm going to leave covering that and the models on that for you to explore. The only thing I'd say on that, because we didn't really cover that in the marketing content, um, the strategy obviously is their approach. Culture, we can look at Hofstede's um, cultural dimensions there if they operate overseas. I'm very briefly, just going to sort of recap this. The resources, um, it is worth considering there's something called the resource based approach of the firm. So basically, you design your strategy around the resources that you have available. And then socio political. Um, that also ties in with the external factors as well, but socio-political, but what goes on internally in the organisation, the factors that impact it. Then externally, we're going to look at a model, uh, a pestle analysis, uh, and I'll bring up the slide for that, which we covered previously. And then the market forces. Again, um, these are things that we haven't covered in a lot of depth. In fact, on um, in the marketing elements, the only bit we've really covered is the media messages in our communications. OK, so, um, yeah, the internal analysis, as I say, we haven't really looked at this in the marketing elements. So the strategy, you'll be finding out what direction they're going in. The culture we're looking at. Um, this ties back to the marketing frameworks, actually, that start with looking at the mission. Um, what's the organisation about? How do they do things within the organisation? But it could link internationally to um, Hofstede. 
and um, how they operate on those cultural dimensions. The resources, I've mentioned something called the resource-based approach or the resource-based view of the firm. So we're looking at what we've got available uh, and capitalising on that with our strategy. And then we're looking internally at the uh, social and political. Um, the market analysis, um, and by the way, sorry, in these, you only need to focus on two of them. In the um, breakdown of the assignment, they've actually got a breakdown in terms of the number of words, and you've only got a couple of hundred words for each one. So actually, you only can only focus on two. Same here, market analysis, you pick two. Um, so consumer trends, this is where you'd be looking at the databases to find out um, spending trends and things relative to that organisation. And the other elements here we haven't uh, looked at in the marketing apart from the media message, which we have looked at in our communication strategies. OK, but the environmental analysis, this is the one that we've really looked at. OK, so you're looking, you're tying it into the data that you've found on their financial performance. Um, but again, we're only picking two of these to really look at in depth. We need facts here. We need references. We need an analysis. So in terms of a framework to look at, the PESTLE analysis is um, a really useful one. Um, to give us a framework to look at the whole marketing environment. So I'm going to talk you through each of the elements, but what I'd like you to do is not focus on them all. You mustn't because there isn't enough word count to do that. What you need to do is just focus on two of them. So just one second, because I'm going to explain to you what they are and the sorts of things you can consider in some depth so that you've got some ideas. OK. Um, so political, what we could look at here, it's all about is the political situation of the country which they're operating in or countries. Does that affect the industry? We're also looking at economic factors. So that's under economic. Is there a recession? What's their position in terms of the economy? What's the gross domestic product? Um, social, we can consider here things like the culture in the market, how it's determined. Technological, what innovations are going on? What are they, what's likely to pop up in the market and affect the structure? Um, environmentally, are there concerns uh, for your organisation? Are there things that they're looking at to mitigate? Are there things that they're using to give themselves a competitive edge? And then legally, are there any current legislations that regulate the industry? Are there any that are coming up that have changed? But this gives, so it's a really useful and comprehensive analysis that feeds into the SWOT because actually the opportunities and threats come from our PESL and then the strengths and weaknesses come from internally. So you really, it's, um, you really need to go into quite some depth here, but you also, you need to ensure that you're citing sources when you look at these because otherwise you're not fully completing the elements that you should be looking at or you're not fully given the evidence that you should do. So political, just to recap, it could include things like a new tax, a new duty, uh, the taxing system, for example. Um, it can include tariffs um, that a government may have around sort of trading in particular environments. Economic, so this can be the performance of the economy, which will impact people's buying power, basically, and it can have very long term effects. Um, rising inflation in particular countries could really impact how pricing of products and services is conducted. Uh, interest rates, exchange rates, economic growth or decline. Um, and it also things like their foreign direct investment. So how your organisation sits on that, whether they've capitalised on trading in certain countries. Um, but it's all about, yeah, you need a very much a data driven approach to looking at this. So our social factors, uh, this is the social environment, and this can be like cultural trends, demogra demographics, uh, population analysis. Um, it could be buying trends. It can be, it's just like consumer trends, really, how people are behaving. And this connects with other sections in your report. Um, 
technological factors, uh, access to technology actually as well, because there may be technology advances, but if they can't be adopted in the countries in which they're trading, they're not fully able to embrace them. So uh, adoption, but also um, what they're capable, their technological capabilities. Um, economically, we're looking at um, the business environment, uh, like climate, but environmental factors that affect it. So climate, weather, geographical location, um, like different um, environmental offsets that they might have to do. They might tie in with the economic as well, because there might be certain environmental challenges that the government is then getting involved in. Um, so you may actually choose quite wisely to do the two that are connected together. And then finally, we've got the legal factors, um, certain legislation that's in place in certain countries that can take part, take into account um, strategies they have to have, consumer laws, safety standards, labour laws, for example. So we should have in that, I hope, quite a few examples for you to, to complete. But as I say, please don't do more than two. You need to do two. It's better to stick to the amount suggested and to do them in depth and to really demonstrate that you've got the research behind you. OK, so an alternative for looking at the market environment is Porter's Five Forces. And what this is all about, it's about power. So who has power within the organisation? And it's used to analyse the level of competition. So um, it depends on the competitive landscape. So it's looking at how profitable the organisation could be. But actually, you've already got the profit figures because you're looking at those databases. But it really is good to look at the competitive landscape. Um, so it was used initially to show whether it was worth going into certain industries or not. So you could look at the competitive landscape and look at who's likely to enter. Um, into that landscape? Who are the direct competitors? How much power do your suppliers have over you? How dependent are you on them? And how closely do you work with them? Um, how much power do the buyers have over you? So if you have a mass market with a lot of consumers, they're likely to have less power than a few um, companies that buy from you if you're business to business. And then substitutes, are they easily available readily available alternatives that people trust and actually if they're in place what do you do to protect yourself against those so we also need to consider here um, a communication approach so what we'll do here we'll go back um, to the week where we consider I'll just find it out the drip model as well because this was a really helpful way of looking at how communications work. OK. So we've got. OK. So when we've got our marketing communications, what we're looking at here is a plan that's in place to ensure that we've got a strategy that supports the direction of the organisation. So you're critiquing how the communications are planned and managed within your the organisation that you're considering. Um, so there is a communication planning process that is similar to the marketing planning process where we analyse where we're at, we look at where they're going, we look at how we make that happen in terms of the tactics we've got for the marketing communications and we measure their success. A measurement is what you're able to do when you have access to that data and information that you'll be finding. So let's consider here on this um, slide chart the uh, drip, because this is what the um, template for the approach to the assignment is suggested. So this is one way in which we ensure that we analyse communications to see what their purpose is. So the first reason we may send out a marketing communication is to differentiate ourselves. So it's to show how we're different from the competition and to position ourselves in our customer's mind very differently. And this moves on to the perceptual map that we'll be looking at shortly. The second reason why, why we may communicate, if people already know what we do, they know who we are, so that might come through our differentiation step, is to actually reinforce what we're already doing. So to remind them or reassure them. So this is the Coca-Cola's um, Christmas 
um, lorry that goes round. So it strengthens Christmas means Coca-Cola. So you're just building on existing knowledge and you're triggering those memories. OK, the next thing that we can use our marketing communications for is to make people aware, is to inform them and educate them and let them know about the functionality that we've got available. We finally want a call to action because actually if we're spending money on our communications and we're putting effort and resource in, we want to make sure we get results. And this ties back to the market, to the strategy which you've looked at in this assignment. So we want to see what their objectives are, where are they going and actually how does the marketing um, fit in with that so but what are the calls to actions in their marketing communications what are they trying to get people to do next so another thing that we want to consider so here's an example in terms of um, drip so differentiating in the UK Cravendale is a milk that's premium price but it's also seemed as premium quality because it's filtered so we're differentiating by explaining there's a different process in place that we're using Reinforcing, so McCain's that do a lot of potato based frozen products are talking about the minimal use of um, additives that they have and the nutritional contents in their products. So they're good products. The third thing we're doing is we're making people aware. So, for example, in uh, our COVID environment, our government is doing a lot of communication on reinforcing certain behaviours by making us aware of the implications of our action. So there's a lot of public announcements at the moment, far more than there would be um, outside of this sort of time. There's um, normally any government communications that are public announcement type ones are more about um, obesity or more about self-care um, in terms of mental well-being as well. Um, but we're seeing a, a raft more communications about informational communications at the moment because of the um, pandemic situation. And then persuade, sell it bang, bang and the dirt is gone. So we need to buy it to get rid of our dirt. So basically, we've got a strong sales focus call to action. And then we've got here, we've got examples of differentiate. So very liquid, premium price. But for that, we get a lot more usage than we would do against our competitors. So that's why it's different. We've got Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is about happiness, it's about sharing. So they reinforce that through the imagery that they use. And actually, as a global brand, is one that they could use across a multiple number of geographies because it's so um, it's not specific to a certain area. So it strengthens what we already know about Coca-Cola and its world domination. And then informational, here we go. Um, this one was actually disputed about Dyson Pure Hot and Cool, about whether the benefits that were given were actually correct or not. Um, but this one is about showing what needs to be done, what the features are of the product or service. And then finally, we want people to act. So in um, sort of public awareness campaigns, it's about shock. Because if we get if we shock people, but with facts, um, but we do it in a visual way, then they're likely to act. Uh, in a commercial setting, something like this would be more around getting people to buy, getting people to swap to whatever you are selling. OK, so let's go from that section and go back. So we've looked at the drip model. We've looked at communication strategies about planning those activities through the model that we saw. And let's just recap on what segment and targeting and positioning is. And then we'll look at a positioning map. So, OK, so segmenting, targeting and positioning. So segmenting was about looking at common features. And by common, I mean those that people share in common in order to classify groups. So this could be age, it could be gender, it could be job role, it could be social class, it could be um, age, it could be um, disposable income, it could be attitudes, it could be culture. So we've got so many different groupings. And actually, we covered this on, um, let's have a look which week it was. I think it was week two. Yes, so we looked on week two about segmentation. There were two um, lectures that did a, a short one about an example of how a company segmented their target audience. 
because we work out how we can group people together and then we build a profile and we decide those are the ones that we're going for. So in this example here, we've got the three in the middle that maybe are hipsters that we're going for. So aged 18 to 25, um, live away from home, but in rented accommodation and live in the city and have a small disposable income, but are open to different sorts of things. So actually are looking for, to innovate. And then in order to appeal to them, we need to position what we do. So we do that by looking at the product, the place, the price and the promotion. So what we need to do when we're segmenting, we're considering all the different variables that we could have for our market. We're then validating, have we got enough people that fulfill, fulfill and meet that criteria? Um, so the seminar on week six, um, that's what that did. We looked at um, different types of um, no, that was actually, sorry, the seminar on week two did exactly that. And that should be recorded and available online, at least one copy of it, where we looked at how to group people together. So once we do that and we've got our group, sorry, we then do in our positioning and we're going to make our offering really attractive to them. So positioning is about trying to ensure that we've got a mental position uh, in our customers' minds or potential customers' mind through our company's communications. So it's about, it's about a logical plan, but about a mental construct that we're trying to create. And it's a really important one because it will differentiate us from our competitors. So we had an example, uh, again, this was week two, about how different three different types of chocolate had the position in people's minds. So we had a very cheap own brand bar of chocolate. We then had in the middle dairy milk, which is a well known, well loved, um, perceived as being a British brand, even though its owner now is not British. And then we had a very premium type of chocolate that tends to be used for gift giving. Um, so a perceptual map can be used and there is a suggestion that you use a positioning map in this assignment to understand, based on your target customers, what perceptions are they that your brand has relative, so in comparison to your competitors. Um, and so we're looking, we need to take two different measures to do this. Um, and then to actually position ourselves on the map as to where we sit um, relative to those other ones in the market. And what we can do by doing that is we can see, are we sitting in the right place? We can see are there any massive gaps in the market. If there are on that perceptual map, would actually that mean that we could create a new position? Would that mean we have to change our target customer? That would be okay. We could actually go, if we go back up here, from positioning, so we could find a position on the map, and from that we could define a target customer base from the position. So we could go the other way around, which would be quite innovative. Um, so here's a very standard type of perceptual map. So we're looking at two axes, price and quality. Um, price and quality used to be seen as a trade-off because if something's a high price then it's likely to be good quality if it's a low price it's likely to be low quality however we have a lot of value brands now that perform well on both of those so very good value these brands and actually there's an opening marketplace for this as people are more concerned especially for products for which their usage they're not particularly well connected for with these type of products so for people who aren't particularly interested in what cars they drive, they want to drive a reasonable car that's fairly economical, they might be happy to go with a brand like Dacia rather than a BMW or a Audi or something that's seen as more of a premium brand. So it all depends on the personal perception of that category before you even look at the brand. Okay. So we need to see where the brands fit on this um, and against our competitors on these different axes. Um, so here we've got the car industry, we've got X and Y variables, and we've got a number of companies within it. So um, we're looking at this range of cars here. Um, so we need to look at two meaningful axes. And actually the ones, so they're the two things that you're measuring on. Where you tend to go from that is actually look at ones that are useful from your consumers 
your customer's point of view. So what would they measure success on? What are they really interested in? What are the two things? If there were two key influences on whether they buy or consume your products and services, what are they? Okay. Um, so product positioning is exceptionally useful to see the mental positioning of our customers and our potential market. So potentially we may need to change. It can identify if we've got gaps in the market, if we're not performing where we should be, or it can identify where there's already too many people in the market, this red ocean strategy where we need to be somewhere else. Okay, so they can help identify opportunities for new brands and new products. So here we've got on this one, we've looked at those brands that we mentioned earlier, the uh, automotive brands and the criteria that we're looking at are from inexpensive, so they're really cheap through to expensive. And then we've got from really practical cars through to sporty cars. So actually, if we have a young family and a limited income um, and we might then be looking for fairly cheap and pretty practical. So in that case, we've got we have a Skoda, for example. So um, we feel we don't necessarily need an expensive car, but at a different stage in our lives, our children have left home. We've got a bit more money. We want something a bit more exciting. We go up to a BMW or if we have the funds, we go up to a Porsche or even a Ferrari if we've got that much money or we're prepared to borrow that much money because just because the price is high doesn't necessarily mean people have the disposable income to buy it because one of your criteria might be for your target customer um, their ability or their willingness to borrow to purchase the things that they find are of value to them so in terms of digital marketing um, positioning maps show where really it's the same it's the same basis so brands are it's the brand generally rather than the product that people have a, a mental position about. So they have a perception that a certain brand means a certain thing. Um, so, yeah, you can just um, this is very useful looking at your organization and looking. You could even look at reviews as to how it's performed to get the idea about the perception. You can look at sentiment analysis to understand how you feel it's performing. But this ties in the position with the evidence and the data that you can find to see where it sits relative to competitors. So to recap all this, positioning shows consumer perceptions uh, and it shows them against their competitors, um, generally on a brand basis, but it may be on a product basis. And by understanding that, you can build a competitive advantage. So I think this is quite useful to sum up in terms of positioning. So what we've got, we have um, the potential to have a brand that's seen as the best, so top of the range. Um, we can, in terms of how people perceive the brand, what's the level of service around it? That may be really important, but actually people may be happy to trade off the level of service um, for speed, for example. Um, so if it's a fast food, restaurant they might actually want something quick to eat rather than paying for a sit down meal and table service in a more traditional restaurant environment um, so it isn't that it's performing any worse but it's fit for the purpose which they're going for uh, we also can look at value for money so in terms of the positioning even if it's expensive do we feel it's worth it which is one of his l'oreal strap line because it's worth it or because i'm worth it so this idea of a connection with the brand with the individuals purchasing it uh, l'oreal is quite an interesting one because actually they have so many brands under their umbrella so you think it's just a one brand but actually there's a number of beauty brands that are positioned for different types of customers so they have a much wider market share but their communications are targeted according to their different customers. Reliability, is that an important factor? If it's a highly disposable good, it may not be, so it might not matter so much. If it's a real trust-based service, if it's a really big decision, a highly involved purchase, then actually reliability could be of paramount importance. Attractiveness, so this doesn't necessarily mean just the physical appearance, but actually, 
Is it easy to use? Is it practical to use? Um, how attractive is it to engage with? Is it going to perform at a level I want? Now, as a marketing or a branding sort of uh, element, country of origin is about ensuring it really is where in the story of the brand um, you build in some perceptions or stereotypes based on um, a country in the story. So actually, if it's made in Germany, it's perceived to be better than made anywhere else in the world. However, if we want something connected with design and want to be really excel on the design, it would be useful to have an Italian connection in the story. So the brand name, the identity, that's important because that gives an impression that actually we've got a level of quality associated. So what do people already perceive and know about your brand? And then selectivity, this is about how is it different um, between other brands and your brand. So actually, is it, um, do they pick it because it's uh, differentiated from others? So we're thinking here with these factors, they're all useful, but what you really want to do as well, this is a data driven report, so it can't be subjective. So we need to be really careful when you're addressing this assignment to make sure that you have as much data to support it and data to compare its performance against others. So whether they're on um, psychological factors or behavioral factors or whether they're on actual numbers of sales and things like that, and then connect them to the theory that we've been looking at. What I'd urge you to do, so this was literally just a, a half an hour recap on the marketing elements which would be useful for assignment two. And you can go back to the full lectures and the um, seminars that are available on them. But what I'd really urge you to do is to use the seminar time as one-to-one -one time and pop in and get support um, either this week or next um, with Sama and she will help you um, develop your ideas further and you can run them past her. Okay, thank you very much and I look forward to marking them. So good luck with it.